Welcome to the Religious Studies Project, hosted by David Robertson and myself, Christopher Cotter. This podcast is produced in association with the British Association for the Study of Religions, and you can visit our website at www.religiousstudiesproject.com. Secularism, the separation of religion and state, has since the Enlightenment been a central narrative in the European political sphere. But with renewed calls to Christian national identity and the problems in accommodating Muslims, Western secularism seems increasingly under threat. Uh, to discuss that, we're joined by Tariq Madud, Professor of Sociology, Politics and Public Policy at the University of Bristol, and Founding Director of the University Research Centre for the Study of Ethnicity and Citizenship. So, thank you for joining us. What do we mean by secularism? Well, as you said, um, the key idea of secularism is that religious authority and political authority and religious reasons for acting and political reasons for acting are distinct. Distinct doesn't mean that there can't be any relationship between them or that they don't overlap. Indeed, I think they do. Um, different people will interpret what distinct means. But I think the core idea of political secularism is that there are at least these two distinct forms of authority. Um, and some people have argued that the most, as it were, um, justified form of secularism is where the two forms of authority are seen as mutually autonomous that neither is dominated by the other. Are all secularisms the same? I think there are a variety of different kinds of secularisms. Um, I would say that if we look at the literature and the way that public intellectuals have debated these matters, past and present, um, there are two forms of secularism that seem to be most referred to in democratic debate. Mm -hmm. I say democratic debate because secularism has also been part of a tot totalitarian system. Yeah. You know, obviously, Soviet Union, China, various other kinds of authoritarian states. So, if we're, if we're thinking about democratic secularism, there are two models that are commonly referred to. One is the United States Constitution, federal constitution, where there is a specific kind of, as it were, wall of separation, yeah. as Thomas Jefferson described it. The specific clause in the Constitution says, there shall be no establishment. And this was, of course, a desire on the part of some very religious people, because obviously, as we know, the United States was founded, was populated initially, insofar as populated by Europeans, by p people who were seeking religious freedom. Mm -hmm. So these were very religious people, so the, but they wanted a state which didn't tell them what to believe. Yeah. So they thought this was best achieved by the state having no favoured or privileged church or doctrine. Um, and that's what really they meant when they said there shall be no establishment. Though, of mm -hmm. course, like everything else, lawyers and philosophers argue about exactly what it does mean in practice. But they didn't think that a secular state was a state that was in any ways hostile to religion. Yeah. And we see this in the history of the United States, where uh, in many ways religion is seen as not just an important part of society, but a very important part of the public debate and the uh, political imagining of the American society. It's just that all this debate and imagining has to take place outside the offices of state. And indeed, American political parties at different times can become very religious. Um, they can be captured by certain um, religious constituencies. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen this in the last 
decade or two in relation to the Republican Party. Yeah. And to some extent, that has created a reaction in the Democratic Party, of which, you know, Obama is perhaps an example, because he too is someone whose politics has been very much influenced, partly by his um, racial identity, but certainly also by his sense of um, Christianity, which he says in his biography is very much in his mind connected to a sense of African Caribbean, sorry, African American community. Yeah. So that's one model of secularism where you have a constitutional separation, quite a strict constitutional separation, but no other separation and where religion is allowed to flourish as a public sphere activity. The alternative then, I presume, would be a state where uh, it was uh, portrayed as, a, as a, a society without religion. And is that... As a society without religion and where religion is thought as disruptive, divisive, or um, as disabling in some way. Yeah. Disabling meaning robbing people of their true autonomy and their true reason. Um, which is much more the European Enlightenment model. Yeah. Though actually, I say European Enlightenment, it's actually French Enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> the Scottish Enlightenment, the German, and even the English, insofar as there was an English Enlightenment, did not have that view of religion. Yeah. Um, so it's more the Voltaire Robespierre view of religion than, say, the David Hume view of religion. And that is that religion is seen as a competitor to civic ideals of equality and justice. And they, of course, understood religion very much in terms of the Catholic Church, yeah. with its organized hierarchy and ultimately, of course, its autocracy. And they felt that you couldn't have true equality, not just without the monarchy and the aristocracy, but also without a hierarchical church which had always allied itself with royal power. So the revolution was targeted at the destruction of an authoritarian church. And that view of secularism as part of republicanism is built into the French view. Just like the American... Um, understanding of secularism has varied over time, despite the presence of a single constitutional clause, I think it's also fair to say that the French, over a period of time, have interpreted and reinterpreted their understanding of secularism, or as they call it, laïcité. Yeah. They've had periods of what one might call more rigid interpretations. I think certainly the, the period immediately after the French Revolution was yeah. like that, but the concordat that Napoleon Bonaparte made with the Catholic Church is much more of a compromise and would have been repudiated by many of the revolutionary generation. Yeah. Similarly, I think the 1905 Act, which is the current constitutional basis for uh, laïcité in France, is a compromise relative to some of the arguments of the secularists at the end of the 19th century. And what's happened now is that at the end of the 20th century, for the third time in French history, we've seen the um, emergence of a, a radical interpretation of laïcité. So mm -hmm. maybe it's something about the end of centuries, the end of the 18th, the end of the 19th, and the end of the 20th century seems to make secularists in France go somewhat extreme. And the present extreme has been very much triggered off by the presence of Muslims, because it started in 1988-89 with the headscarf affair. Mm -hmm. And the, because this second model of secularism sees the duty of the state to enable a certain kind of equality, unlike a more laissez-faire uh, understanding of American freedom, the French idea of, of freedom, you know, like the Republican idea, is that the state 
enables, it's, it en emancipates people. It doesn't just give them negative freedom, but it gives them the conditions to be, as it were, truly free, to use a kind of Rousseauian term. And religion is seen as one of the single biggest um, detrimental factors to people's freedom, of course, you know, mm -hmm. capitalism as well, and, and poverty and so on, but religion. And so the French view is that the public sphere, certainly public institutions, above all the school, should be emptied of religion. Unlike the American view, which is all religions may flourish, the French view is the privatization of religion, the absence of religion in the public sphere, and the state's responsibility to maintain that condition from social threats. And they see the presence of Islam and the claims of certain Muslims, which we might refer to as Islamicists or conservative Muslims, or even actually just ordinary, everyday and garden Muslims, they see this as threatening the strict public-private boundary that they divide. So that's two models of secularism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the two, as I said, that are most referred to in discussion. What I've been trying to do in my work is point to a third model, mm. which I believe is actually historically truer for most of Northwestern Europe, except for France. And even in France, we can see uh, traces of it. Okay. And this third version I call moderate secularism. It too, like all forms of secularism, recognizes the distinction between political authority and religious authority, and that neither should be dominated by the other. But unlike the French model, it sees religion as having a public benefit and not just a private one. Mm -hmm. And unlike the American model, it sees the state as sometimes playing a positive role in bringing about the conditions so that religion can be a public benefit. The Americans don't disagree that religion can be a public benefit. The majority of Americans would agree and would always have agreed. But they believe that this public benefit must be done through civil society, through private associations, churches, communities, neighborhoods, and so on. Whereas I think the Northwest European view, following the what we might call the nationalization of churches at the time of the Reformation. The European view that's developed is that religion, above all through the favored church by the state, can play a positive role in helping to uh, give people certain forms of freedom or equality or welfare or community cohesion. So religion can be part of, say, a national identity. And that clearly has been the case in, say, England, mm -hmm. in Scotland, in um, Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway, very much the North Western European model. It's slightly differently practiced in each country, and I think Germany in particular has a, a more corporatist understanding of public religion than we do in Britain or other people have, and then I personally would want to endorse. But nevertheless, I recognize that in Germany they don't have constitutional establishment like mm -hmm. we do in, in England, but actually they have, I mean, the churches play a much bigger role in Germany in social welfare mm -hmm. and in being, as it were, social partners to the state, just like trade unions do and have done. Um, so the churches are seen as one of the social partners, but not just in civil society terms. They receive an enormous amount of public funding. Right. Um, the German uh, federal government transfers a lot of tax to um, churches. In fact, it collects tax on behalf of churches. It's a voluntary tax, but many people um, have paid it voluntarily, and it's quite significant. I believe it's 9%, which is a, 
you know, 9% of one's income, which is a considerable amount of money. Yeah. But in, on top of that, the Jef German government uh, funds quite a lot of welfare activity. So in this third model of moderate secularism, there's more a sense that organized religion and political authority can be partners. The, the, there has to be limits to this, obviously, in order for there to be uh, mutual autonomy, which mm -hmm. I think is central to secularism. And it has to be consistent with freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. So clearly the time when you had to be an Anglican to be an MP and so on, I mean, that's clearly not just gone, but it would be and was iniquitous. Yeah. But nevertheless, I think in moderate secularism, we don't think of religion as a public player as in itself problematic. Yeah. And that is quite distinct from the other two forms of secularism. And I think that it is the form of secularism that is essential for integrating the new religious pluralism of Western Europe, which of course has Muslims at the forefront for both for demographic reasons, but also for a number of other socio-political reasons. Because I think most Muslims, not just Islamicists and extremists, but most Muslims subscribe to the view that religion is a public benefit and that religion should be respected by secular institutions, unlike the French view, mm -hmm. and that where some degree of partnership is possible, it should be uh, pursued. So Muslims, for instance, as everyone's aware, some Muslims are very keen to have state-funded uh, Muslim schools join the thousands of Anglican and Catholic and other Protestant church-based schools funded out of the public purse, properly regulated and monitored, of course. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons that you get bodies like the Muslim Council of Britain mm -hmm. that have quite clearly a public political agenda and want to meet ministers and the government and lobby them on behalf of their constituent organizations and for what they see as the well-being of society. So I think that model of secularism, what one might call the partnership model, is if we are um, sufficiently mindful of history, we'll see that that, and not the French version, mm -hmm. is the dominant Northwest European model. The irony is that we were drifting away from that due to long-term historic processes of social uh, secularization, we were drifting away from that just at the very time that a very religious people were beginning to settle in mm -hmm. Northwestern Europe and become citizens in Northwestern Europe. So we now seem to have what looks like a kind of clash or a contradiction. We have what you might call a secularist expectancy of a mm -hmm. European destiny, and we have Muslim expectations about how to be integrated as Muslims and not just as secular individuals. Well, this, um, to go back to the, the, the French example and the banning of the, the burqa and all this kind of, it seems like a, a top-down um cause of this of this so-called crisis of secularism yeah. but there's also a bottom-up crisis of secularism and um, I'm thinking particularly of the furore surrounding the um, satanic verses in the late 80s that that was very much um, coming from the the Muslim communities um, rather than from a state seeking to to affect the relationship between state and religion. Um, how different are these two mechanisms? And are this meeting in the middle, is this what you're talking about in this kind of moderate secularism? Yes, I think, David, that's absolutely right. I think that the, uh, the kind of British activity in this front has been very much grassroots-led. It's been Muslim-led yeah. and the state and other political actors, and for that matter, the churches, have basically been reacting to Muslim political claims-making and Muslim assertiveness. Mm -hmm. 
and they've been mainly reacting by accommodating. Not in every single instance, and you know, you'll get lots of Muslims who will say this is a Kafir state that's oppressive to Muslims and so on, but that is not the dominant view of Muslims. Mm -hmm. On the whole, the, the British state and local authorities and so on have been accommodative of Muslim claims making and have seen it as a continuation of ethnic minority claims making. Mm -hmm. But in France, where they don't even recognize ethnic minority claims making, they have seen Muslim claims making as a violation of one of the fundamental principles of the Republic, as mm -hmm. a threat to the uh, Republic. And they have reacted in top down ways. Mm -hmm. First of all, the, uh, the hijab ban in the schools, now the burqa ban in public places, which unfortunately is spreading now to other countries as mm -hmm. well. Several mm -hmm. have joined the ban. So I agree that we have a, a top down process and a bottoms up process. But on the whole, the top down process tends to characterize laicite secularism and the bottom-up process with a compromise as a result tends to characterize what I'm saying is the moderate secularism okay. of Western Europe. Great. Um, I wonder how much this kind of crisis, or at least it's not a crisis so much, it's just this becoming something that we really need to you know, be aware of, um, is, is driven by changes in in the relationship between ethnicity and religion, I, I suspect that there's been a, um, with its, uh, sort of diaspora communities that, um, these communities have begun to associate their ethnicity and their religion much more. And so this has become more of an issue with their living in, in these, um, other states. And would, would that be something that you, your research would, would hold up? Yes, David, I, I think that is true. I think that ethnicity and religion has become mixed up, but it's not new. No. If you think about Irish Catholics in Britain, if you think about Jewish people in Britain and uh, other countries, including the United States, I think we have histories of faith communities who, as a result of migration, are also see themselves as ethnic minorities. And, you know, some people who think they are very Jewish can also be very atheists mm. and, you know, they're not synagogue visiting, visiting Jews. And I think that that phenomenon is true of, say, Irish Catholics. And I think it's actually a phenomenon that we are beginning to see amongst Muslims in Europe. I don't personally think we're going to see it as a majority phenomenon amongst Muslims or not in the short term anyway, who knows, you know, over a generation or two. Um, I think that there is also a religiosity amongst many Muslims which is greater than the religiosity of contemporary um, European countries. So, but the religiosity isn't really the main issue. What most of the argument is about is what you might call the making of the public space, what is and isn't permissible in the public space. Nobody really minds how religious you are if you don't make any claims in public. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're very short of time here and there's a, a lot more we could talk about. Maybe you could make a, just a brief closing comment on where you think this process um, is likely to go and are, are we going to see a lessening off of these issues, particularly in places like France, or is this a process that's going to continue for some time? I think it will continue for some time. I can't see it disappearing. I mean, one could say, oh, well, with the financial crash and so on, economic issues have become more to the fore. But I don't think these issues are going away um, quickly. I would conclude by saying that there seems to be a triangular relationship. There are some people who want to have more radical secularism than we have today. And, you know, we see that in the Burqa ban and some mm -hmm. other things that people say, you know, newspaper columnists, Guardian columnists and people say. Some people want to pluralize our understanding of public religion away from Christianity to include Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus and others. And then in recent years, we're beginning to hear voices that talk about the re-Christianizing 
of Britain or of Europe. And probably Pope Benedict is right at the forefront of that. Now, the big question is, how do these three points of the triangle relate to each other? Will what I might call Christianists and secularists find common cause against Muslim pluralists? Or will Muslims and Christians realize that actually the secular settlement would mean that each would lose and they, therefore they should unite? Who can tell? I wouldn't like to make a strong prediction. But my general feeling is that the core issue will become whether we accept the pluralization of society or we work to homogenize it more, whether it is a, a secularist homogenizing or a Christianist homogenizing. Professor Madid, thank you so much. Thank you. That was another interview that we recorded at the Sockrell Conference in Chester earlier this year, and that is, of course, the British Sociological Association's Sociology of Religion group. Well, next week is our 20th consecutive weekly podcast. Uh, it seems pretty incredible to me, but even more incredible is that we have about the same again lined up for the future, which takes us right up to about October time, even if we didn't do any more, and we've got lots of plans to do more. So why not consider subscribing via iTunes, via email, or via your, your favourite feed reader so that you don't miss anything that's coming up. Next week is an interview between Jonathan and Timothy Fitzgerald from the University of Stirling on the subject of religion, non-religion, and mystification. And I'm sure this is going to be a very popular and possibly controversial podcast. So do come back next week for that. If you have time, please rate us on iTunes. That can do a lot to help us bring this podcast to a broader audience. If enough of you do it, don't forget to check out our Facebook page. It's really quite a lively community. We've got a lot of, um, of interesting little bits and pieces on there that doesn't come up on the main site. So if you're interested in taking part in the discussion, um, please do check it out. But until next week, and as always, thanks for listening.